Now we're going to embark on a series of explorations. The explorations will involve the title that you see on the screen above me, local, locating the zeros of a polynomial function. Now you know how to do this if it's a linear function, that's easy. You know how to do it now if it's a quadratic function because you have the quadratic formula. There are also cubic formulas and quartic formulas if you want to know. There are no formulas for degrees five and above. They do not exist in general. So there's a whole question of how one locates the zeros of polynomial functions. And so we're going to address the questions that are involved here one by one. And then at the end, we'll put all the tools together and give you a strategy so that you can attack these sorts of problems. So the first question is, naturally, how many zeros are there? So let's go ahead and start that. How many zeros are there? Well, before I can answer the question, I want to set the scene here so that we're talking about the same kinds of things. Here, we're going to limit ourselves. Here, we explore only real coefficient polynomials. I'll put coefficient in parentheses because I'm going to drop that after a while. Only real coefficient polynomial functions. Now, we could study ones with complex, pure complex coefficients, but that really would take us afield from what we want to do. So our polynomial functions will only have real coefficients, as you've seen since we've uh, started this course. But I wanted you to know that we're limiting ourselves to that. What do they look like? Of course, let me remind you once again, f of x is a sub n x to the n plus a sub n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot, 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 down to a sub 1x plus a sub 0. You know, after all this time, you should be getting pretty quick at writing that out. And that's part of the plan here, so that you can learn the notation. Where, let me remind you what we said this meant, where a sub n was not 0, so that the, the highest degree is n, is that's legitimate, and that all the coefficients, as I just mentioned, a1, a n, a n minus 1, all the way down to a0, are all real numbers. We are limiting ourselves to real coefficients. Now, let me also point out that, of course, this doesn't say anything about the zeros. Of course, the zeros of this function f may be real or complex, as we saw with quadratics, which, after all, are polynomial functions of degree 2. Now, there, there may be someone out there objecting to the, my use of the phrase real or complex. So I'm going to say a couple words about that just to tell you why I'm stating it that way. OK. This, let me call this a language note. Now I'm doing this for purposes of emphasis. First point I want to make is recall. This is something we studied back in basics under numbers. Recall, the set of real numbers R is contained in the set of complex numbers C. All the real numbers are also complex numbers. Let me show you how. Remember complex numbers? They are of the form A plus BI, where the A and the B numbers come from the real numbers, and I is defined by I squared equals minus 1. That, in short, was the definition of complex numbers. Real numbers are also complex numbers because real numbers can be written as a plus 0 times i because that's equal to a, which is a real number. So every real number can be, in the, be put in a form that makes it a complex number. So the set of real numbers is contained in the complex numbers. There's no question about that. And I'm not saying that that's not true. However, so, although saying the phrase I mentioned, saying real or complex, is redundant, it's repetitive, we still use this phrase, real or complex, 
for emphasis. I want to emphasize that the numbers might be complex in the sense of being simply b times i with no real part added to them at all and b not zero. It's possible. So I'm going to say real or complex in that sense. So those of you that were objecting to that language, that's the reason I'm doing this. And I will continue to do this. OK, let's get back to the question of this section. How many zeros are there? How can you tell if you're given a polynomial function with real coefficients of degree n, say? How many zeros will it have? Well, the answer is going to come from one famous theorem and another one that follows directly from it. Here is the famous theorem. It's called the fundamental theorem of algebra. Now, you may recall back in basics, we talked about something called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which you may recall told us how to take natural numbers and factor them down to prime numbers or powers of prime numbers. This is going to lead us to a theorem that's analogous to that. Fundamental theorem of algebra, and I'll put in parentheses for real coefficients, because those are the only sorts of polynomials we're looking at. In fact, this theorem also works if you allow complex coefficients. So it's really quite a nice theorem. Here's what it says. It says if f of x, say, is a real polynomial, because those are the only kind we're looking at, a real polynomial function, and the degree of this function, the degree of f, is equal to n, and that's some number greater than or equal to 1, some natural number, then f of x has at least one real or complex zero. So this says that no matter how high the degree of the polynomial, you are guaranteed that there will be at least one real or complex zero. The proof is too hard for this course. In fact, it takes some complex variables to solve it, to actually prove it. I'll tell you who did this first, who proved it first. It was a man named Gauss, a very famous mathematician. And he did it in 1799. So there's a little bit of history for you. Tells you the depth of this result. But you know, we're more interested in, in, the in the theorem that follows directly from this. This says that every polynomial has at least one real or complex zero. The theorem that follows from it is the one that we will use to answer the question of this section. And let me call this, say, the complete factorization. Or if you like, you can call it the n zeros theorem. So complete factorization, or n zeros theorem, and you'll see why it's called that, goes like this. If f of x is a, as usual, real polynomial function, this is the only kind we're looking at, and the degree of f is equal to n greater than or equal to 1, just as before, then we can say more than the previous theorem, something that will be practically useful for us. Then it factors uniquely, as a matter of fact, which should remind you of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, numbers factored uniquely into products of prime powers. It's, it factors uniquely into n linear factors as follows, to be exact f of x is written as a sub n, the leading coefficient of the leading term, x minus r sub 1, x minus r sub 2, all the way down to x minus r sub n. And what are those r's? Well, they stand for the zeros, where r1 up to rn are real or complex zeros real or complex zeros of f. And 
they are not necessarily distinct because they may have different multiplicities. So let's write that down. Not necessarily distinct, which takes into account the possible different multiplicities. So if you have a real polynomial function of degree n, it factors uniquely into n linear factors, just like this. Now remember what we said earlier. If you have a linear factor x minus r that divides your polynomial, then that r is a 0. In other words, r1 to rn are all of the zeros, if we count multiplicities. So we are almost ready to answer the question. Let me put a uh, however, though, because I want to make sure that you realize what, just what kind of theorem this is. However, this n zeros theorem which really is very helpful, doesn't do the following. It does not tell us how to find these n zeros, possibly repeated. Okay, we have a theorem that tells us of their existence, but not tells it, does not tell us how to find them. So now, finally, we can answer the question that was posed at the beginning of this segment. Here's the answer. How many zeros are there? The answer is a real polynomial function of degree n has exactly n zeros, the same number as its degree as long as you are counting multiplicities in there. Counting multiplicities. So if a degree, if a zero has uh, multiplicity five, then you count it five times in this count. So there is the answer to the first question, how many zeros are there? All right, we'll stop there and move on to the next question. Now that we know how many zeros there are, we want to ask the next question, which is more important to us as people who want to graph, how many zeros are real? Because remember, every real zero is an x-intercept of the graph. So let's go ahead and begin to answer this question. How many zeros are real? Well, the theorem that will help us answer this question is the following. This is the key idea behind the result we want. Remember, the zeros that are real, again, are going to be x-intercepts. So keep that in mind. Theorem. If f of x is a real polynomial function, the only kind we're looking at, a real polynomial function of degree n, which is greater than or equal to 1, of course, and if you know that a plus bi, where a and b are real numbers and b is not 0, if that is a 0 of f, then the theorem says you don't just have that one complex 0, you got another one. Then a minus bi is also a 0 of f. And this is the conjugate of the original complex number a plus bi above. And now I'm omitting the proof of this, but if you recall what we did with quadratics, you'll remember that that's what was true there. Quadratics had complex number zeros which came in conjugate pairs like this. So all this theorem says is it works for polynomials of degree n where n can be 1, 2, 3, or any other degree. So another way to say that, non-real, this is where I'm being a little more specific, non-real complex numbers or complex zeros always appear in conjugate pairs. And the operative word here is pairs. So, 
If they appear in pairs and they are not x-intercepts because only real zeros are x-intercepts, we get the following corollary. Remember, a corollary is just a tiny theorem that follows immediately from another theorem. The corollary is going to be the corollary that answers the question. If f of x is the same situation as before, a real polynomial function, if it is a real polynomial function of degree n greater than or equal to 1, then, and here's our answer, the number of real zeros, which of course correspond to x-intercepts, of f is one of the following numbers. There are either n real zeros or there are n minus 2 real zeros, or there are n minus 4 real zeros, etc., until you run out of number. The proof of this I will omit, but I think you'll see the idea. By subtracting 2, what I'm doing is I'm subtracting possible complex zeros, which occur in pairs. So either all the zeros are real, or if there is a complex one, then there are two, so that means there are n minus 2 real, or maybe there are two pair of complex number zeros, and that would be n minus 4 real ones left over, etc. And you just continue on down until you run out of the number n. So that proof is easy enough. And there's another corollary that's so quick, I'm going to put it down, and it's handy to know. Corollary 2. It says, and when you think about this, this is also obvious, if f of x is, as before, a real polynomial, real polynomial function of odd degree, whatever degree it is, it's an odd number, then what can you conclude? Then f has at least one real zero. You're guaranteed of that. Why is that? Well, think about it. If n is an odd number and it's the degree, and the number of real zeros is n, or n minus 2, or n minus 4, or n minus 6, etc., then if you subtract away all of those even numbers, you will, in the end, end up with at least 1, because the original n was an odd number. And that 1 will correspond to a real 0. So the proof of that, I think, is pretty clear, so I won't write that down. Okay, well, there's a couple of results that were really in exactly the area we wanted for our question. Let me recall something else while we're here, because I want to throw in a theorem that is addressing this question, since this is exactly the right place to put it. Recall our definition that a quadratic, now that's degree two, a quadratic real polynomial function, as we saw earlier, it was called, there was a name for it, it was called irreducible. And under what conditions was it called irreducible? It was irreducible if its two zeros, if its two zeros are non-real complex numbers. So when the two zeros are conjugate complex numbers, we call the quadratic irreducible. Because reduction would mean taking it down to linears that involve complex numbers. So irreducible as far as real numbers go. We have a theorem we can write down here, which really fits in with everything else we've been doing theorem. And the theorem answers a certain question, so I'm going to write the question it answers underneath here. The basic question is, how far can you factor? How deeply or how finely can you factor a polynomial function while avoiding complex numbers or non-real complex numbers? Okay non-real complex numbers. So suppose you do want to factor 
and you want to get it down into as many factored pieces as you can, but you don't want to have any of the pieces involve complex numbers. The question is, how far can you go? The answer is, you can go this far. If f of x is a real polynomial function, then this is how far you can factor f. Then f can be, and it's even unique, can be uniquely factored into a product of linear factors possibly, linear factors, and or irreducible quadratic factors. Irreducible quadratic factors. So that says that if you want to take a polynomial of any degree, degree 30, degree 50, and you want to factor it down as far as possible, then if you go down to totally linear factors, then some of those linear factors may involve non-real complex numbers. If you want to only go down to where real numbers exist, you might have among your linear factors a few quadratic factors, and they, have, of course, will be irreducible quadratic factors because their, uh, their zeros will be non-real complex numbers. So to give you an idea of what kind of factorizations I'm talking about, let me give you an example and illustrate several factorizations here. Example, here is a function, f of x equals 2x cubed minus 2. It's a very simple cubic. Now there's a trivial factorization that you can do immediately. You can factor the 2 out and get x cubed minus 1. So that might be called a trivial factorization. It's not complete, it's just sort of the first thing that you see. Now, if you know a little bit more, the x cubed minus 1 is a difference of 2 cubed. We talked 2 cubes. We talked about that previously in one problem. I don't expect you to remember this, but if you happen to, it will factor into 2 times x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 1. Now, this is as far as you can go with no non-real complex numbers. Now that is as far as you can go. You notice that there is an irreducible quadratic here. How do I know it's irreducible? Let me go ahead and write in here in a box, it's irreducible. And I know that because I take b squared minus 4ac and I get 1 minus 4, which is minus 3 and that's less than 0. And less than zero means complex, non-real complex zeros, which means that it is irreducible. Now, if I want to factor this quadratic further, I can. The fundamental theorem of algebra in the last section tells me I can. So, 2 times x minus 1. And then the factors I get will have the complex zeros appear. Now, I've already worked these out, so I'm just going to illustrate them to you. The next factor is x minus, here's the first complex zero, minus 1 half plus square root of 3 over 2i. And here's the second one, and you know it's going to be a conjugate. So it'll be x minus, and then minus 1 half minus square root of 3 over 2i. There's that conjugate. And there you are. This would be a full fundamental theorem of algebra factorization from that factorization theorem, that complete factorization theorem, or the n zeros theorem. So when you're asked to factor something as simple as this, there's really different places you can go. If you want to go as far as you can without reals, this is the spot. If you want to go all the way down to linear factors totally, you'll have a couple of complex numbers, but then you get three factors here as you expect. So, having mentioned all of that, now I'll give you the answer. We've seen it already, but let me write it down formally. The answer to the question of this segment is a real polynomial function of degree n greater than or equal to 1 has one of the following numbers n 
n minus 2, n minus 4, et cetera, real zeros. Counting multiplicities as we always do. Counting multiplicities. So that answers the question of this segment, which was how many of the zeros are real? And having answered that, we'll stop here and we'll move on to the next question we can ask. Now we know how many zeros there are and how many of those zeros are real. Now let's go within the real zeros and see if we can divide things up a little bit further. One thing we'll look at now is how many real zeros are positive and how many of them are negative. There's a nice way of telling that takes a little bit of effort but sometimes can be quite worth it. So here we go. How many real zeros are positive or negative? Definition. Before I get to answering this question, I have to sort of set the scene and define a concept here, which I'll illustrate in a moment. The concept is the following. A variation in plus or minus sign in a real polynomial function, again, the only kind of functions we're looking at, in a real polynomial function, occurs when, what do I mean by variation? Well, what I mean is when two consecutive coefficients, as you move down the polynomial, two consecutive coefficients have opposite, opposite plus or minus signs. Now that's what I'm going to mean by variation. Let me show you in an example. Here's my example. The function is f of x equals 2x to the fifth minus 7x to the fourth plus 3x squared plus 6x minus 5. Now I said a variation is when you look at consecutive coefficients and the plus or minus sign changes. Let's see what we have here. The first coefficient is 2, the second coefficient is minus 7. So here is a variation in sign. The second is minus 7, the third is plus 3. So we have another variation. The third here is plus 3, the next one is also positive, so there's no variation there. But then from 6 to minus 5 is yet another variation. So the plus or minus signs vary in those three cases. And the one here, there is no variation. There are none, okay, because the signs are the same. That's all that variation is. Now, the important thing for us is going to be to count the number of variations. So I'm going to introduce a handy notation here. I don't know how standard this is, but for our course, this is what we'll use. I tried to make it as simple as possible. And you'll see why I'm using the pluses and minuses as we find out what these numbers can tell us. Here's the notation, and here's what I'm going to use. Let V, standing for variation, and then parentheses plus parentheses. So it looks like V of plus. What will that mean? That will mean the number of variations, just as we counted them above, the number of variations in f of x, the original function. Then I will let v with a little minus sign inside be the number of variations, another number of variations. This is the number of variations in f of minus x, where you've gone into f of x and replaced x everywhere by minus x. You'll get a new polynomial, and that polynomial will have its own set of variations. Here is the major theorem that will answer our question about positive or negative real zeros. This theorem is sometimes called the rule of, well, plus or minus signs. Now this rule is due to a mathematician named Descartes, 
And it's been around a very long time, since the beginnings of calculus. But it doesn't use calculus, thank goodness. If f of x is a real polynomial, the only kind we're looking at, a real polynomial function, then here is the conclusion that we wanted. Then there'll be two statements here. The first is the number of positive real zeros, the number of positive real zeros of f is one of the following numbers. It'll either be the exactly the value v of plus, the number of variations in f of x, or it will be that number dropped by 2, or that number dropped by 4, etc. And of course, the dropping by 2 or 4 is because we're dropping out possibly complex numbers. And the number of negative, that was the positive, and so you probably guessed what I'm going to write down, the number of negative real zeros of f is one of the following, v of minus, v minus minus 2, v of minus minus 4, etc. So, in short, if you want to know how many positive or negative real zeros there are, compute this variation for f of x and then the variation for f of minus x, and then either those numbers or the numbers you get by subtracting 2 or 4, etc., will give you the number of positive real zeros and the number of negative real zeros. So let me go ahead and illustrate that by showing you an example. That's where all of this stuff comes into play. And this is the same example I had before. Let me write it out. f of x equals 2x to the fifth minus 7x to the fourth plus 3x squared plus 6x minus 5. OK. Well, first of all, I want to know the variations involved with f of x, and then I'm going to want to know the variations for f of minus x. So let me show you what I need to do to get the f of minus x, and then I can do both at once. What I want to do is substitute minus x into f of box, right? Just like we've done before. Replace the box, or the x in f of x, everywhere by minus x. When I do that, and I'll show you now this the first time and not again, 2 times minus x to the fifth, minus 7 times minus x to the fourth, plus 3 times minus x squared, and then plus 6 times minus x, minus 5. Now, of course, that simplifies, and we could have done it all in one step. Because if you take minus x to an odd power, the minus is preserved. If you take minus x to the even power, the even power removes the minus. So that would have made it a little simpler. But if we finish this off, this is minus 2x to the fifth, minus 7x to the fourth, and then plus 3x squared, and then minus 6x minus 5. OK. Well, with these two functions on the page, we can count the number of variations for f of x, and likewise the number of variations for f of minus x. For f of x, let's go up here. We did this before, let me remind you. There was a variation here, one there, none here because the coefficients are both positive, and another one here, so that's three. So there are three variations of f of x. For f of minus x, let's see, minus, minus, no variation, minus, plus, there's one variation, plus, minus, there's another variation, and minus, minus, no variation. So there are two variations for f of minus x. OK. Well, let's take those numbers. So using the theorem, so f has, let's see, there were three variations for f of x, so it has three or one positive real zero. real zeros, and it has two or none, zero, 
negative real zeros. Because the number of variations of f of x was 3 and the number of variations of f of minus x was 2. Oh, and incidentally, this checks positive and negative real zeros. You may ask the question, what about 0? Is 0 a 0? Well, that's usually easy to tell because there will be no constant term in your polynomial if 0 is a 0. So that's why we're not even bothering discussing it. OK. Well, that's how you would work out the positive and no negative real zeros. Again, this doesn't tell you what those zeros are. It just tells you how many there might be. Example. This is what I'll call a summary question that will summarize what we've just done in this sec segment and also some of what we did in the previous segments. Summary question. Here's the question. What combinations of zeros are possible? What combinations of zeros are possible in a given situation? Well, let me give you a situation to look at. f of x equals 3x to the fourth minus 2x cubed plus 3x minus 5. OK. Now, to answer this question, how many combinations of zeros are possible, I want to do a count on all the various types that I know about. The first thing I observe is that the degree of f is equal to n, of course, and that's 4 in this case. So that means if I'm counting real zeros, I know that I have 4, 2, or 0 of them because there are n, n minus 2, or n minus 4 in this case. OK. Once I know that there are a certain number of real zeros, I might want to find out which are positive and which are negative. So to do that, I'm going to compute f of minus x. Now remember, the minus will be lost with powers that are even and preserved by ones that are odd. So that makes it very quick to write this out. So 3x to the fourth plus 2x cubed minus 3x minus 5. So therefore, I can read off immediately that the variations for f, let's go up here. There's one variation there. There's one variation there, and there's another one. So it's 3. And therefore, there are 3 or 1 positive zeros for this function. And then the variation, the number of variations for f of minus x, I can read from here, let's see, plus, plus, no variation. There's a variation, then minus, minus, no variation. So there is one variation, which means there's one negative 0. And that's fixed. There has to be 1. Because I can't subtract 2 there, so 1 has to give me an actual 0 in this case. Great. I'm on my way. I can then pull all of this together and I can conclude that there are four zeros because the degree is 4. And they could be in the form of 3 positive plus 1 negative. And if that's true, then I've used up all four zeros, which means there must be no complex. And by that, I'm meaning non-real complex, even though I'm not writing it. Or, now that's only one possibility. The other possibility is that the four zeros could be 1 positive plus 1 negative. And if there are only one of each, that uses up 2. There must be then 2 complex. And that makes sense because complex, when they occur, come in pairs, conjugate pairs. Now, if you didn't like the way that was just written out, let me give you a little chart that you can create that may make it look a little neater. This is a handy chart that you might consider using from time to time. Here's a handy chart. And what it will be is one that will show me the possible combinations of zeros. Um, combinations of zeros. And here's how I'm going to design this. I'm going to make a column for the degree of the polynomial. Then another column I'll mark plus, and that'll be for the number of positive zeros, and a minus will be for the number of z negative zeros, and I'll use i to indicate the number of complex zeros. So that's just making it short. 
Then I'll put a double line below, and then one between the degree and the rest of them. And then I'll fill in all the possibilities that can arise. Well, I happen to know how many there are here, so I can actually complete this into a nice little box. The degree is four, and from above we know that there are the possibilities that you could have three positive here, one negative, and then no complex, and then from the second one, one positive, one negative, and two complex. Now realize that these add to four in each row. Three plus one plus zero is four, and one plus one plus two is four. So that is just a nice handy device that may help you when things get more difficult later. Okay. Let me answer the question we started this section out with. Give you the formal answer now. It's nice to have the answers all at the same places. Answer, a real polynomial function has one of, let's see, v plus, v plus minus two, et cetera, positive zeros. and v minus, v minus, minus 2, and subtracting even numbers, number of negative zeros. And these will be, of course, counting multiplicities as we always do. So there you are. We now have the answer to the question that was posed at the beginning of this segment. And with that, it's time for us to stop and then come back with a further question about zeros. Now we know something about the numbers of zeros, real zeros, and we've, we've teased apart real zeros into positive and negative real zeros. Now we want to ask a larger question. After all, the real number line is infinitely long in both directions. Well, where are these zeros? Are they all clustered around the origin like all the textbook problems we see, or are they somewhere else? So, the question is where, on what interval, are all the real zeros? And if we can bound that interval with a lower and upper bound, then we'll be able to find out where they are by using our graphing calculator if we need to. So, let's go ahead and start this. And in order for me to talk about boundaries, I'm going to have to introduce a notation we haven't seen yet in this course. It's an easy notation, so I hope you get the hang of it pretty quickly. The notation is this, MAX standing for maximum, and then there'll be set brackets, and then there'll be a number of numbers inside there, say A, B, C, up to D. What will that mean? What will this new symbolism mean? It will mean the maximum the maximum of the numbers enclosed. So let me quickly give you a couple of examples so you know how this is used, and then I'll show you how we're, we're going to use it a little bit later. Suppose I want the maximum of the numbers 1 half, minus 10, 0, and 5. Well, of course, the answer is 5. So the maximum of that set of numbers is 5. Here's another one. The maximum of minus 1, minus 2, and minus 35 is going to be minus 1. Be careful there. Minus 1 is the biggest of these numbers. So that's all that that symbolism is, symbolism is for, just finding the maximums of things. Now, the way we're going to use it is as follows. It's going to look a little different. So this is uh, notation continued. It's going to live, look a little different. We'll see specifically the following. We're going to see two versions of this. We're going to see the maximum of a set of numbers that will look like this. Absolute value of a sub 0 over a sub n. Absolute value of a sub 1 over a sub n. All the way up to absolute value of a sub n minus 1 over a sub n. Now that's a list of numbers, and you can tell what they are if you remember the coefficients of polynomials that we've seen. 
a sub n is the coefficient of the highest term of the polynomial. And if we were to divide all the way through, all the other coefficients, the constant term, the, the, term, the coefficient going with degree 1, all the way up to the coefficient going to degree n minus 1 here, if we take those numbers and make them absolute values so they're all positive, and then we figure out the max of them, that's what this symbol would mean. So we're going to see this coming up, so I wanted to make you aware of that. We'll also see the following. We'll also see the maximum of this following set of numbers. One is one of the numbers, and then there's one other number, which is the sum of these fellows up here. So a naught over a n plus up to the last one, a n minus 1 over a n, absolute value. So here there are just two numbers. Okay, because this is a sum, it makes a single number. Here we have a lot more numbers. In fact, there are n of them. But I wanted to show you what these symbols would look like before we got to them in the theorem coming up. And it's nothing to be frightened of. It's just that that's what it's going to mean. And when we do it in practice, you'll actually have real numbers in here. So it'll be easy to work with. All right, here's the major theorem that will give us what we need to know to answer the question, where are all those real zeros going to be? Here's the theorem, and the setup is the usual. If f of x equals a n x to the n plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus all the way down to a 1 x plus a naught, and I'm going to do something we haven't done in this way before. I'm going to factor out a sub n a sub n times, there's a new polynomial in here, with the same zeros, by the way, x to the n plus a n minus 1 over a n, x to the n minus 1, plus all the way down to a 1 over a n, x, plus a naught over a n. So all I've done there is factor out the a sub n. You can see that I've done that by, if you multiplied it back through, you'd end up with the first polynomial. Now if that is a real polynomial, means all those coefficients are real, and since it's a polynomial, and it makes sense that the an is not zero, so there's no division by zero here. If that's a real polynomial function, and r is a letter that stands for any real zero of f, Although I will tell you that this theorem works even if we're talking about complex zeros, but we won't get into that. Then we have the following conclusion. Here is the conclusion. I'll even draw a line across so we can separate it from the, the hypothesis. There are two possibilities. Both of these hold. And you can use whichever one is easiest in the given situation. The first I will call A, and the second I will call B, and try to refer to those throughout the rest of this segment. What does A say? It says if you take this real zero, any real zero, in absolute value, it will be less than 1 plus the maximum, and this is the first thing we saw on the previous page, the maximum of these coefficients here from right below the x to the n to the bottom in absolute value, comma, up to the last one, a n minus 1 over a n, all of the roots will have absolute value less than this. So that gives a boundary, because remember what absolute value does. Absolute value less than something gives you a right and a left-hand side. It is also true that the absolute value of r is less than or equal to the maximum of 1 and the sum of those numbers, a naught over a n plus up to a n minus 1 over a n. Now you might say, why am I giving two? Well, because not both of them, both of them don't give you the smallest answer, and they don't give you the same answer all the time. So sometimes you might want to alternate between them. So the numbers that appear over here, whether as a list is in this first bound or as a sum in the second bound, come from this version of the polynomial here, not including the x to the n, the coefficients of these made positive by hitting them all with absolute value. So when we actually do this, that's pretty easy to use, and I'll show you in practice. But this gives you two different ways to bound where all of the roots are, or all of the zeros are, will be. 
So let me write out a few things, because I've been saying some things that need to be written down. Meaning, all the real zeros, all the real zeros of f are located within either of the intervals, and I'll call them minus m to m. That is to say where the absolute value of r is less than or less than or equal to m. So I'm taking the bounds on the previous page and just calling them generically m. That forms an interval minus m to m, where, as I just said, m is either bound A or B above. So this allows you to have an interval in which all the real zeros will exist. Now, an efficient way to use this, so an efficient way to locate real zeros, okay, is to calculate both of these bounds. So calculate both of them and pick the smaller one. So calculate the smaller because that will make for a tighter interval here if the number is smaller. Calculate the smaller m, then graph y equals f of x, or you know you could graph the f of x over a sub n, which is the polynomial that was within the parentheses in the window, which would go, of course, from minus m to m in the x direction. And then the y direction doesn't really matter if you're only looking for where the zeros are. Just say minus 1 to 1 to be consistent. OK? So that's my recommendation. Let me make one more set of remarks here. And then we'll go ahead and attack some problems and see how this all fits together. Remarks. The first bound of the two bounds, the first bound, which I labeled A, is slightly easier to calculate. Slightly easier to calculate. If you remember, in that second one, you had to add all those numbers together. Now, that can be tedious. On the first one, you just have to pick out which one's the biggest. That's a little bit easier. And as I said when I wrote the theorem down, neither bound, A or B, is always the smallest. Sometimes one will be smallest, sometimes the other will be smallest. So I'm giving you the option, and you choose the one that's best. Since the interval minus M to M may not be tight, or may not be very tight. See, this theorem will work for all sorts of polynomials. And on some of them, the interval will be very, very large for a very small number of roots. So it may not be very tight. Just refine the window as needed. Now, by now, I hope you realize that this is a common sense thing to do with a graphing calculator. But I wanted to make sure that we had written it down and you were aware of it. time to do an example so you can start to see how this works. And it's not formidable at all. f of x, let me write this out. This is a long one. 3x to the fifth plus 5x cubed minus 9x squared plus 4x plus 12. And let me factor that 3 out front because I know I'm going to need the coefficients divided by 3, so I might as well do it right now. So 3 times x to the fifth, of course, plus 5 thirds x cubed minus, well, 9 divided by 3 is 3, x squared plus 4 thirds x plus 12 divided by 3 is 4. Now, let me go ahead and try the first bound. I'll call it m, just like I'll call the other one m. What is that bound? If you remember from the theorem, it was 1 plus the maximum 
of all of the coefficients that appear here. Whoops, I drew that x there, and that x should be up here, sorry. All of the coefficients here made positive by taking only their absolute values. So it's very easy to just walk down here and read them off. 5 thirds, 3, 4 thirds, and 4. And see, it's very easy to tell which is the biggest by just a glance. Obviously, 4 is the biggest. So this becomes 1 plus 4. And so this first m is 5. Now I'll compute the second one because I don't know which one is bigger. And I want, of course, the smaller of the two. So let's see what happens here. m for the second one is the maximum of the set of numbers 1, comma, and then the sum of all these numbers here. So it's 5 thirds in absolute value, plus 3, plus 4 thirds, plus 4. Well, I don't have to do any further work now, because the maximum of, of 1 and this will obviously be this sum. This sum is clearly bigger than 4. So whatever this is, this is bigger. And so I will just ignore it. The one I want is the first one then. And that will give me the interval minus 5 to 5. And so with that in mind, I'll go ahead and graph my function in that interval and see if I get all of the roots that I'm hoping to see. Okay, this first part, of course, is the minus mm interval. All right, what do I get when I do this? If you try this out yourself, you're going to see the following. The axis like that, and you're going to see a line coming down here. There will be one intercept, one x-intercept in view. Now that's all that you see. Of course, it's very hard to tell whether that is going to be the only real root. Remember, this is a polynomial of degree, what was it, 5. And if it has degree 5, it could, it could have 5 real zeros. It could have 3, and it could have 1. Now, this shows 1. It's not clear that this is exactly all that happens. The reason is because the scale may be too large or too small to show all the fine detail in here. So I'm going to use other information to settle the question of zeros here. Now I have all the information I've gathered up to now. I, know now. I now know that the number of real zeros, as I just said, equals 5 or 3 or 1. Okay. If I compute f of minus x, so I can check out whether how many should be positive and how many should be negative, Putting in minus x, I get minus 3x to the fifth, minus 5x cubed, minus 9x squared, minus 4x plus 12. If I go back to the original function and try to find its variations, here's the original function here. How many variations will it have? Now I can look at the variations in this form or in this form. The plus or minus between the terms will not change. So I'll use the first one because it's easy. Variation there. Variation there, so I have two variations in f of x, so at v plus is 2. So that means the number of positive zeros is equal to 2 or 0. And then what is v minus? Well, here's f of minus x. Let's just look for variations, none, 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 none. Here's one, one variation. So that the number of negative zeros is exactly 1. So, I look at my picture and I see, aha, one negative zero. It does indeed appear up here. And what about these other zeros? Well, they would appear here if there were any. So apparently there must be zero of them. Well, I have zero positive, one negative, and zero, of course, does not work as a zero here. So that means I have one real and that means the rest should be complex, and indeed that's what they are. The other four zeros are complex. Okay? So, this boundary certainly did help us decide which pattern of zeros we had. So this is what will happen very often. Let me show you another one, because in this one, 
Remember, it was the first bound that gave us the smallest. Let me show you an example where the second bound might give you the smallest, just so you'll be aware that you need to check both. Suppose f of x equals x to the seventh minus 2x to the sixth. Now, of course, I can factor that immediately into x to the sixth times x minus 2, and I just do it automatically, whether or not I need it immediately. Of course, with that in mind, I can immediately see the zeros. There's one zero. x equals 0 is a 0. We'll have multiplicity 6. And I can also see the other 0. x equals 2 is a 0. And it has multiplicity 1. So let me go ahead and check the bounds, because that's what I want to check in this problem, in this segment. The first bound, m is 1 plus the maximum of the other coefficients, once I've divided the first one, of course, there's only a 1 here, so I don't have to do that. There is only one other coefficient. Its absolute value is 2. 1 plus the max of 2 is 1 plus 2, and that's 3. Let me check the other bound, which is easy. m is equal to the maximum of 1 and the sum of all the other coefficients in absolute value. There's only one. It's 2. The maximum of these two is 2, so look. The second one has the smaller bound this time. If we then use that information in a picture and look at the window minus 2 to 2 by, of course, minus 1 to 1 by default, and we see what we get, we get a window that looks something like this. On the screen, you'll see this curve coming over and then a line coming up like this. Remember, in drawing this window, I'm not interested in seeing all the various parts of the graph. I'm just interested in seeing where zeros are. Now, it's clear that there is a zero here at zero, and one here, if you check, it's at two, which corresponds to what I saw above. And this one here touches, which makes it seem like it ought to be, be a zero of even multiplicity, and it is. It's of multiplicity six. So everything is corresponding to what we know. And you can draw other conclusions if you like. All I wanted to do here was check that the boundaries are indeed a, f a very fair way of locating all of the real zeros. All right, on my last page here, let me write down the answer to the question that we started with so we have it all in one place. Answer, a real polynomial function has all its real zeros, which is what we're looking for, located within either interval m minus m to m determined by the bounds a and b above, bounds a, bounds a, and b above. So that answers the question. And let me add one final note before we leave this segment. There are many, many theorems on the bounds of real polynomials. I've picked two that I thought, bounds A and B, were fairly easy to use and always give you the complete picture. All the real zeros will lie within the boundaries dictated by either one of these. And I hope that they'll help you as you continue and try and do some of these problems. We have a lot of information now about locating the zeros of a polynomial function, a real polynomial function. Uh, one question is, uh, how do you get started on this? And sometimes, frankly, guessing is a good way to begin. So I wanted to say a couple of words, just a very short statement on how can you guess the location of real zeros? Now, you want to use all the information that you're given before, but there are a couple of things I can say. One thing. I can say that you might guess based on the specific f of x that you're given. That might involve trial and error, if you want to try that. It might involve factoring, if you can factor your f of x. All of these things are techniques that you might want to try to see if you can come up with a zero 
or something near a zero. Of course, the other thing that you can certainly do is you can guess from the graph, because wherever it crosses the x-axis will give you at least a real zero. Won't say anything about the complex zeros, but at least from guessing from the graph uh, for real zeros. So here you're trying numbers in the actual algebraic form of the polynomial based on any insight that you might have into the polynomial. Things like if you see that it has no constant term, then obviously zero is going to be a zero of the polynomial. And there are other things that you might happen to see. You can also guess from the graph. Now the things you'll get out of this, unfortunately, will often be approximations. It's possible that you'll get an approximation that will suggest an exact value, but usually you'll have approximations. There is another way of guessing. Guess based on the intermediate value theorem. Now remember we talked about this theorem before, back when we were talking at the very beginning of Unit 3. And the intermediate value theorem applied here will look like this. Let's go ahead and write it down for you. It is also a common sense kind of idea. Theorem, if f of x is a real polynomial function, Again, the only kind we are looking at, a real polynomial function and f of a at some number and f of b some other number have opposite plus or minus signs, then you know that at least one real zero lies between A and B. And again, like I said, this is very commonsensical because what it means graphically is the following. Suppose you have, and I'll assume A is less than B, it could be the other way around. Suppose you have A and B, and you know that the function has a negative value at A and a positive value at B. Since we're assuming these functions are nice, continuous functions with no holes, in order to get between those two points, it's got to pass through the x-axis somewhere in between. Or it might go the other way. If you have a and b here, and you have a positive value at a, f of a, and a negative value f of b, it may look like that. But in either case, it has to pass through if it's a nice continuous function. So that's the intermediate value theorem. So if you're examining numbers in your polynomial, and you get one that's positive and one that's negative, then you know that between the A and B that gave you those numbers, there's going to be a real zero. All right, that's all I have to say about guessing at this point. You want to use guessing judiciously, and you want to add to it all the many pieces of information we've gotten before. Now, suppose you could reduce the number of real zeros. Wouldn't that be nice? Then instead of having to look for five real zeros or ten, you could find just a smaller number. Well, I'm going to pose the provocative question, how can you reduce the number of real zeros? The honest answer is you can't. If you have a polynomial of degree n and there's a certain number of real zeros, that's all there are, you can't reduce them. But what do I mean by this? What I mean is perhaps by judicious d division, you can take the polynomial and break it into parts, each of which has a smaller number of zeros to search for. So let's go ahead and, since I'm talking about division, let's go ahead and recall what we know about division. Recall the business about dividing polynomials. Now we saw this for the first time back in basics. I think we've done a little bit since then. But let's recall the process again so that you'll be clear on the generalization I'll make. Okay. I'll do this by example. I'll take x squared plus x plus 1, and I will divide it by x plus 2. What I'm going to do now is write a box here that I will continue in a moment, and I will go ahead and do the long division algorithm. So let me write down x squared plus x plus 1 here as we always do. Write the divisor out front and give you some arrows so you can follow the process here. I am moving down. 
from the original quotient to the long division form. And how do I do this? I need to find something up here that will multiply by x, that will equal x squared. That's easy. That should be x. So I get x squared plus 2x, and then I'll subtract that away. The first part, by design, is always going to be 0. Then I have x minus 2x leaves me minus x. I bring this 1 down. That's a plus 1. What do I multiply to get minus x? Multiply this x by minus 1. So I have minus x minus 2. Again, I subtract that away because that's the algorithm. And the, by design, this first part's 0. And then 1 minus a minus 2 is going to be 3. Then I will take this 3 up here along with the divisor and the quotient and write out that x squared plus x plus 1 over x plus 2 is x minus 1 plus 3 over x plus 2. And that's the process you probably remember. Taking a quotient of polynomials, doing the division, then rewriting it this way. And what was the advantage, if you recall? Well, look at this one. Why did we want to divide anyway? Well, the degree of the top was 2 to the degree of the bottom was 1, which makes this improper, like an improper fraction. It's too high on the top for the bottom. By doing the division, we get a polynomial piece here plus a remainder. And notice that the remainder of the top is of degree 0, less than 1, which is the degree of the bottom. So now this is a proper fraction. And so we're much happier with that than this improper fraction. That was the whole reason for co concocting this division. Now, let me rewrite this by imagining that we multiply through the whole thing by x plus 2. That will eliminate both of these denominators and put a factor of x plus 2 here. That is the form in which we're going to often see the result here. So let me write that down so that you'll remember that. Rewritten x squared plus x plus 1 can be written as x plus 2 after that multiplication times x minus 1 plus 3. And that is all on one line. There are no more rational expressions there. This piece here is called a divisor function. This piece here, because that is the, that is the binomial that we divided by, this is called the quotient function. And this is referred to as the remainder function. And by multiplying the divisor times the quotient and adding the remainder, you end up with the original polynomial that you wanted to divide. All right. Let's put this all together into a theorem which will generalize the notion of division. Now, this is a major result. This is a theorem. It's sometimes referred to as the division algorithm. Algorithm, of course, is just a process for doing something. A division algorithm for polynomials. So we're going to write down the entire process in general in the formal case. So if, let's say, f and g are real polynomial functions, so real polynomial functions, and I'll put under here, and g is not the zero function. There is a function out there that's equal to zero all of the time. We want to make sure that g is not that function. Then we can conclude the following. There exist, and they're unique, there exist unique real polynomial functions. I'll put this to so save a little space here. R polynomial functions. Call them Q of x and R of x, and those are meant to be suggestive letters, such that, let's see here. You can write out f of x over g of x. That will equal q of x plus r of x over g of x. And that should remind you of our first example. Or the way we'll write it more often, we can write f of x equals g of x times q of x plus r of x. And that's writing it all on one line as I did on the previous page. The g of x is the divisor function. 
The Q of x, that's why it was labeled Q, is the Q for quotient function. And the R of x, with labeled R, is R for remainder function. Where either one or two things happens with R of x. Either R of x is the zero function, which won't happen that often, or either or, or the degree of R, the remainder, is less than the degree of G, the divisor function. So this is a lot on one page, I realize. When we apply it, you'll find that we're using this form on the right more often. And really, this is background for two upcoming theorems. We're developing a little bit of theory here before we go on and answer the question of this segment. But bear with me. This is really interesting mathematics. So the first theorem that I want to talk about is a corollary. It is a small theorem that follows the division algorithm theorem. It sometimes is given its own name. It's called the remainder theorem. And it goes like this. If a real polynomial, a real polynomial function, of course, say f, is divided by x minus c, where c is a real number, then its remainder can be calculated easily. Its remainder is f of c. It is simply the value of the function evaluated at c. Now this is a really nice result. And the proof is simple enough that we can present it and give you a little insight into the nuts and bolts behind it. So here's the proof. And we'll start off by saying since x minus c divides f, by the theorem, that is the division algorithm theorem above, we have the following that we can write down. We can say that f of x is equal to x minus c times q of x, the quotient, plus r of x. So that's how it breaks down after it's been divided by x minus c. OK. Where we can say something about r of x, where either r of x is that zero function. One way to write that is that it's identically equal to zero. That means it's zero for all x's. Or, don't worry, I won't use that notation very much. Or the degree of r is strictly less than the degree of the divisor. The divisor is x minus c. x minus c, but that's 1. Well, there's only one degree below 1, and that's zero, meaning the degree of r is 0 in this case. Well, in either case, if r is the 0 function, it's a constant. If the degree of r is 0, then r is a constant. So r of x is really r a constant. Constant. But then it is easy to see that if you go back to f of x and substitute in c, for x. f of c on the left, c minus c here is 0, so that gives you 0 for that term, plus r, r of x, or r, r is a constant. So what do I have here? I have that f of c is equal to r. Well, that's what I wanted to prove, and I'm done. I've shown that the remainder is f of c. Here is a second corollary. Now, don't worry, these are going to come back later. So you'll have a chance to review all this. The factor theorem is the second of the corollaries. And this is an if and only if theorem. The remainder theorem was one way. This is an if and only if. This is a double arrow. And it goes like this. x minus c, where c is a real number, is a factor of a real polynomial function, 
say F. So that's the first part of the double arrow. That's going to be true if and only if f of c is equal to 0. The only way that x minus c can be a factor of your function, which is a real polynomial function, is if f of c, when you put c in there, you get 0. In other words, c is a 0. Well, here's the proof of this. Also straightforward. And luckily, half of it's already been seen. The direction going that way. You suppose that x minus c is a factor, and then show that f of c equals 0. We, that was done. This was done as a fact in the segment that we entitled Graphing uh, General Polynomial Functions. And you can go ahead and look that up if you want. I'm not going to go ahead and talk about that anymore. Uh, in fact, yeah, I won't talk about that part, but I will go ahead and t tell you about the second part. The second part says, suppose f of c equals 0. Prove to me then that x minus c divides f of x. Well, here's the proof. Dividing f by x minus c gives, we know that we get it to look like this. f of x equals x minus c times q of x plus f of c. Because f of c is taken to be the remainder by the previous theorem. But here, we know what f of c is. f of c is 0. Well, if f of c is 0 and it is removed from here, what's left? So f of x equals x minus c times q of x. Meaning, x minus c is indeed a factor of f of x. So this one was so short, it was almost immediate. But I wanted to give you a little bit of the background. Now, as I promised, let me bring back those two theorems so that you'll remember what they look like. Here is the remainder theorem. It said, a real polynomial is divided by x minus c. If that's true, then its remainder is f of c. And then the factor theorem, which says, the only way that x minus c can divide your real polynomial is if f of c equals 0. They are equivalent statements. So there you are. And it's time for us to do a little bit of an example to show you how some of this could be used to answer some questions. Here's a question. Is x plus 1 a factor of this long polynomial, f of x equals 9x to the 26th power minus 11x to the 17th plus 8x to the 11th minus 5x to the 4th minus 7? My, that's a polynomial of high degree. Solution. Is x plus 1 a factor of that? Well, by the previous theorem, x minus c is a factor if and only if f of c is 0. So if I want to know if x plus 1 is a factor, I check minus 1 and see if f of minus 1 is 0. Let's try it. f of minus 1, well, putting minus 1 in here, it is going to remain negative if this was an odd power. If it's an even power, it becomes 1. So I end up with 9 plus 11, minus 8, minus 5, minus 7. That's 20 minus 20. I'm adding these and then these. Of course, that's 0. So by the factor theorem, the answer is yes. x plus 1 is a factor of this. And that was a lot quicker than trying to do long division on this. I hope you agree. OK, putting this all together into a strategy to reduce the number of zeros, will be the following strategy. First thing you want to guess a real zero, r, and do it somehow. Now maybe you don't have to guess. Maybe you can see one immediately from the problem. But come up with a real zero. 
if and of course if you don't if you're not sure it's a real zero immediately go ahead and check whether f of r equals zero that's the way to check if it's really a zero if that is true if so divide f of x by x minus r this is the reduction I promised at this original statement. Take your polynomial function, divide by x minus a 0. Meaning, what will happen? f of x will then be equal to x minus r times q of x. That will happen by the factor theorem, where the degree of q, the quotient function, is equal to the degree of f, the original function, minus 1. Because here's that 1 degree. The degree, of Q's de the, the degree of Q is now less than the degree of f. This is lower. So you have now reduced the original problem of finding the zeros of f of x to finding the zeros of Q of x, which has a degree which is less. And then once you've done that, just repeat work on q and try to lower its number of zeros further. So that's the technique that I had in mind here. Let me show you one example to illustrate it. Here's a function f of x equals x cubed plus 2x minus 3. Now this is a cubic, so it's really very simple. You don't need to use a lot of effort to find the zeros, but let me illustrate the process that I just described. Zeros. Well, let me try and guess by looking at a graph. Minus 2 to 2 by minus 2 to 2, say. I'm just guessing at this point. What I get in that case, my two axes, and I get a picture where I see this. Now, this zero here, as I check with my calculator, looks like it's about equal to 1. Now, I don't know if that's really true, but I'm going to try it try x equals 1. I compute therefore f of 1, which will be 1 plus 2 minus 3, and yes, it's 0. So this is indeed, it is a 0. Okay, I have now double checked it. Well, once I've done that, the next part of the strategy was to divide f of x by x minus 1. x minus 1 because 1 is the 0. Okay. Well, I will do that on the next page. And here we are. x cubed plus 2x minus 3 is the function in question. x minus 1 is the factor I am dividing by. And I'll do the division. Let's see. I need an x squared here. x cubed minus x squared. Subtract that away. The x cubes go away by design. There is no x squared term, so this x squared term will have to stay. That's a plus x squared. I have this up here, so that's plus 2x, which I bring down. Multiply now by x. I get x squared minus x. Subtract away. This goes th to 0 by design. This is plus x, so that's 3x. Bring the 3 down. I have minus 3. And then I multiply by 3. I have 3x minus 3. That's good because then when I subtract that away, I get nothing left. But I expected that because x minus 1 is a 0. So with that, I can now write so f of x is equal to x minus 1 times x squared plus x plus 3. Now concentrate on this. Repeat here, dot, dot, dot. On that quadratic, you can find its roots. You actually have a formula for it. Of course, if this started out being degree 5, you'd be down to degree 4, and you'd work on that. So that's how the process of reducing the number of zeros works. And that's something you need to practice now.